Uh, all right, so uh, I'll be talking a bit about uh, some performance work that we've been doing with AFXTP. And uh, it's me and Magnus sitting over there. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so I just took this slide from the uh, from the excellent XP paper by Tuke. Uh, the previous presentation has been great about the introductions. I'll skip the, I'll just assume that people know what XP is and what it works, or how it works. Can I get a pointer? You see that? Yeah. So this is where we're at, so in AFXP land. So I'll just do a quick recap what AFXP is and uh, why it's useful. Uh, so first of all, wh why, why it's, it's a mechanism to toss packets quickly out to user land. And also sending packets quickly from user land. So the first question would be, why, why do we need this? Like, why, why not use just the Linux kernel stack? And the reason why we started off is that uh, typically like uh, for radio access networks, they usually need, they have their own weird proprietary protocol that they, there's no reason to do that work in the stack. So they just want to have the packet and do it in user land pretty much. Uh, so that's sort of the rationale for it. So XP was introduced in uh, 4.18, so it's available right now. Uh, and so how does it work? So let's start from a XTP perspective. Uh, so from an XP perspective, AFXP is just another uh, packet sync. So for example, there's no difference from AFXP to say CPU map. So for CPU map, you use the XTP redirect, redirect action to take a frame that you received in the XP program and you hand it uh, via the CPU map and you'll get, uh, you get the frame executed in another CPU on, uh, uh, in, the, in the Linux stack. And same thing with, for example, dev map. Uh, you receive a packet and then you hand it via the dev map and then it'll go out via that device that you specify in the dev map. Uh, and for AFXP, you simply say, you use the X socket map, which is, I don't know, at the moment, when we choose the name, it felt like a good thing. It's really hard to pronounce, so I don't know, X map or X socket map. Uh, but you use that map to redirect to the socket. So that is that you place the AFXP socket into this map, and then you uh, redirect it out to this map. On the egress side, nothing special. There's no XP program there, so you just, uh, yeah, it just gets sent out. Uh, one different from regular INET sockets is that we use uh, a couple of rings to pass information back and forth from the kernel instead of using system calls. Uh, so, right, and some sort of key parts of this. There's something called a UMEM, which is uh, something that a user application allocates. So it's a memory range, which is uh, divided into chunks. And the chunks are sort of like fixed size memory uh, pieces. So UMEM consists of multiple chunks. Uh, and we use different kind of rings to pass information back and forth from the kernel. So the idea is that these rings, they do not pass data. They actually just pass descriptors to these chunks, which is part of the UMEM. Uh, right, so let's have a quick look at the rings. Uh, again, so this is the view from a use application. Uh, the idea, again, the application allocates a range of memory, packet buffers. The packet buffers are chunks, so one packet is one chunk of this uh, packet buffer memory range. Uh, so let's just take a quick review of the receive flow. So uh, an application want to receive packets into say uh, chunk ABC. So the application starts off by placing these ABC uh, descriptors into the fill ring. Uh, the kernel, so by doing so you sort of pass the ownership of these rings to, uh, from the use application to the kernel. Okay. Uh, the kernel will then fill these chunks pointed out by the descriptors uh, in, in various ways. For example, one way would be copying data into this ring. Uh, another way would be placing, uh, uh, 
placing this memory area into a hardware so that the hardware fill the, uh, the chunk. So that's the, the first way is a copy mode, the other way is zero copy mode. Uh, when the chunk is filled, uh, the kernel notifies the application again via the RX ring. So again, it takes, uh, for example, descriptor ABC, places that into the RX ring, and uh, the application can then uh, read off the, uh, the ring. That's the idea. Uh, as for the egress side, it's it's similar. The only difference is that uh, the user application fills in the data up front, so it takes a chunk, fill in the data from the packet buffer, place the descriptor on the Oryx ring, and then uh, you actually need to do a system call here to notify the kernel that, hey, kernel, there's data in this uh, transmission ring, so please pick that area off. So the kernel picks off the data, or the descriptors from the Oryx ring, uh, sends out the packet, and then when everything's done, the application gets notified via the completion ring. All right, so the idea is that what, what kind of optimizations can we do to get to the same level, or can we get to the same level as, as DPDK, for example? Uh, so we started off with uh, a baseline for uh, when uh, uh, the zero copy patches were introduced. So right now, it's Two, uh, two network devices that uh, support zero copy. It's the IXDGB, which is a 10 gig NIC from Intel, and then there's the I40, which is a 40 gig NIC. Uh, so we did, we did all the measurements on Linux 420, uh, which is in RC2 now, I think. Uh, and these kind of, kind of benchmarks, they're only limited by packet rate. So we're only looking at small packets, 64 bytes, and we're only measuring the rates. And the baseline, and you'll see the graphs later. So uh, the baseline is between 15 million packets per second and 22. Uh, so what can we do to improve here? So that's, this is sort of the strategy, like do less. Like do not execute fewer instructions. Other thing is like talk less. Like try to minimize the coherence of traffic, for example. And that is like to... Uh, talking between two cores, for example. Uh, again, do more at the same time. That, that is like, be, be more gentle to the caches. Like, be better at the data cache and, and the instruction cache. And finally, the thing that sort of is, uh, was kind of tricky to find actually, is that all these measurements were done with uh, meltdown mitigation and red line. So what, what meltdown does from a performance perspective is that the system calls will be more expensive. For, mel uh, for the spec mitigation, uh, if you're using red lines, every indirect call will be really expensive, or you won't speculate, do speculative uh, execution for uh, indirect calls. So that, that means it'll be really expensive to do that. Uh, and the third thing is that, or actually the fifth thing, uh, can we sort of extend the user API and get performance benefits from that. So this is the setup, uh, a somewhat old Intel server. Uh, unless noted, we always use two cores for the benchmarks. That means that there's one typical, uh, like a soft uh, RQ thread running in, in the kernel mode, and then there's one uh, application running uh, uh, that in user space. Uh, I'll get into the BISIP poll, but in the BISIP poll scenarios, there's only one core, but I'll get back to that. Uh, to be sure that we're not capped by hardware, we used two network cards uh, and two sockets, so we need to make sure that, so we're not capped by, uh, uh, by the network card. We want to see, are, are we capped by uh, the CPU? And again, we're using a proprietary load generator to generate traffic. All right, so let's start off with, so for the receive side, we pretty much did five different things. Uh, the first thing that we started off with, uh, which is actually user API changes, and the reason for that is a lot of 
much of the feedback that we got from the API is that it's kind of clunky to use. And uh, many, many users of A uh, AFXP just want to create the socket, attach it to a queue, and then, and then be ready. But so all these things uh, with like using maps, attaching XP programs, that's sort of a hurdle for people to start using it. So uh, what we've done first here is that, and this also reduces the amount of code compared to the uh, X socket uh, based one. So there's a new socket option called XP attach and a new BPF called called BPF X socket redirect. Uh, so the idea is that you take one XP socket, you attach it directly to one queue. Uh, and then if you use this BPF helper, the BPF helper will return redirect if there's a socket bound to that queue. If there's not a socket bound, it'll just pass it to the regular stack. So semantically, it's a bit different from the redirect map, but it's sort of, you can think of it, it's, it's the scenario that most AFXP users want to use. Uh, so the good thing about this, that this code sort of reduces the amount of BPF code, so we can, uh, uh, yeah, decrease the, the amount of instructions executed. Uh, that idea, and this sort of ties into the second bullet, is that we, we take this minimal program that most users want, and we make that into something they call a built-in XP program. So the idea here is that if there's so think of it as a two-level hierarchy. So uh, external or regular XP programs will have priority over the built-in one. So for example, if a AFXP user want to, uh, you know, uses attaches and attaches a socket to a queue, it'll start, uh, it'll load the built-in XP program, given that there's not an external program running. And similarly, if there's, uh, if the built-in program is running and you load an external one, the external one will have priority over the built-in one. So the nice thing about this is, then we have an XP program that we know what the behavior is. That means that we can actually can remove one indirect call in the BPF pro program, which is, you'll see in the graphs later, which gives a good performance hit. Uh, so that's sort of the first uh, uh, big thing that we did. Uh, the third item, is that remove yet another indirect call. Uh, so at least this, this one was new to me. So if, you're, uh, if you have a switch statement uh, and which has more than, or five or more items, mm -hmm. it'll be generated as a jump table, obviously. But uh, uh, the jump table is, uh, or there's indirection to, uh, to the jump table. So they'll actually give an indirect call. So we just, uh, you can either like, pass a uh, option to GCC to say like, hey, do not generate any jump tables. Uh, but we actually did the dirty, ugly way, just created a, like a real nasty if-else statement. But that gave a really good performance as well. Uh, fourth thing, driver optimizations. Like more, uh, at least the Intel drivers, are, they're very focused for obvious reasons for the SKB path. So, uh, there were a lot of things that were being done that only made sense for the SKB. So uh, we sort of separated the paths, paths so uh, the AFXP or the XP path is much more lean. Uh, what else? The final optimization is also about reducing the amount of instruction. Uh, so right now, typical call, like for each frame, uh, when you, uh, when, you when, the, <laughs> when the device receives a frame, typically these calls are being done. So you start off by executing a BPF program, would run XTP. Uh, the program returns XP redirect. Then you call into the uh, redirect call, and then you do the flush of the map. So this is like the typical things that are being called every time. Uh, problem is, or problem, this is implemented with a per CPU struct called BPF redirect info. Uh, and so you need to do the per CPU lookup in every call. So if we instead pass an explicit uh, uh, context into all these functions, we can actually shave off some instructions. Uh, and another sort of side note of this is that we have, 
the driver has some knowledge that these functions doesn't have or don't have with these combinations. So you can do some optimization, but the, what you pay for it is much uglier code, unfortunately. So here are the results for the receive side. And this scenario, Oryx drop, is just, it, it's a toy scenario. You, you, take the, you take the frame and you toss it away. So we start off with the baseline. Uh, we create the XP attach mode where we, instead of using the uh, X socket map, we, uh, yeah, we use the attach mode. So we get two million packets there. Uh, we remove the indirect call because we're using a built-in program. We go up to 23 there, the silver. Uh, and from silver to yellow, that was by removing uh, the switch statement. And then again, some driver's optimization, which is, you know, that's a good thing for just, you know, rewriting a switch statement. Uh, <laughs> uh, and finally, removing uh, uh, or having an explicit state in uh, all the BPF calls from a, kernel, uh, from a driver perspective. I need to speed up. <laughs> uh, so again, this is two cores, and it's sort of a, like a toy application. We just take the, take the packet and toss it away. In terms of the eager side, uh, we also started off here with a complaint from, or com some, not a complaint, but a feedback from users, is that Many users just want to create an XTP socket where they just tie to one TX frame. So you want to create multiple sockets, tie them to different hardware queues, but you want to use the same UMEM. So for example, think uh, QA, uh, like different QS uh, classes, for example. Uh, and actually, when we did this, we realized that we were actually kept by the hardware. So it was when we were doing this, we actually moved to, to Nix. Uh, again, much larger batching. So uh, as you see, the eager side is really sensitive to uh, batching sizes. Uh, what else? Right now, we share the XDP queue with the <coughs> AFXP packs. That means that the cleanup, when we actually, uh, before we complete back the, the send frames to, uh, to the user, uh, that the logic that walks uh, through the hardware ring has to be more complicated be, 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 uh, because we're sharing the ring between F XTP and AFXTP. Uh, and, fi and the final thing that we did is adding a new socket option for in order completion. So the idea is that let's remove the completion ring and instead just bump the tail, uh, the tail pointer when the packet has been sent. So again, sort of a toy example for uh, the receive side, but we started off with 25, uh, or toy example because we don't touch the data. We just create the packet up front and then just try to send it up, so try to fill the pipe pretty much. Uh, start off with 25, add support for multiple TXQs, not really a big benefit, but when we increase the batch size in the driver, we get this really big bump from light blue to silver. Uh, what else? Not, do not share the hardware ring with, it, with XTP. We go from 54 to 58, and then uh, all the way up to 68 when we remove the completion ring. So this is a really good I mean, uh, performance development for the egress side. Uh, another thing that we wanted to exp experiment with was like, how can we make the coherence of traffic between cores? Because as I said earlier, we had two, uh, uh, we had two cores running for the previous uh, benchmarks. So the idea is that if we're using the busy polling behavior, which, is, which can be used for regular INET sockets, and the idea there is that uh, you call poll, or uh, uh, the, the system called poll, then you enter the kernel, and the kernel calls uh, the NAPI poll from the poll context. So the idea is that you enter the NAPI poll, you fill the, uh, you, you pick packets from the hardware ring, you create the descriptors to the Oryx ring, and then you complete, uh, uh, and then you turn from the poll call. So this is doing everything from one core. Uh, so the first two benchmarks, and then we added one, which is, uh, uh, L2 forward, which is uh, 
after we actually touch the data, we just to say we touch, touch one cache line of the packet, just swap the MAC address. As you can see, like the total, uh, the total is worse, but on the other hand, it's 39 for two cores, but it's 30 for one core. So the, the per core performance is much better, actually. Uh, and the same thing for uh, the transmission side. All right, so Deep Decay. So Deep Decay is, it's sort of, it's a packet processing library and it's, uh, it's really performant, uh, but they bypass pretty much everything, bypass the, the drivers. Uh, yeah, everything is done in user space. So the idea is, uh, or the downside is, which many of our customers have said is like, they have to re-implement everything that, the, uh, that Linux does in user space. So you get great networking performance, but you have to redo everything. Uh, what's sort of novel about DPDK or one novel thing is that they're using vectorized drivers, which typically the kernel doesn't use. Uh, there's a great paper for, from Steven that uh, sort of highlights the details how DPDK differs from uh, Linux. So I recommend that. So this is sort of the hard facts. Uh, if we start off, we have the arcs drop and the TX push and then the L2 forward. So the first two benchmarks, we don't touch the data. We touch the data in the last one. Uh, so if we're going to compare apples to apples, we should compare the deep decay scalar drivers. And scalar meaning we're not using any kind of vectorization. So on the, on the ingress side, we have 52 for deep decay for one core whereas we have 30 for one core uh, and 39 for uh, the run to completion scenario. Uh, on the transmission side, it's much better. So the gap is smaller. So 51 versus 62. Uh, but I think the most interesting one is that when you actually touch the data, which is a real application, you sort of, you, you get to the same, uh, uh, the same numbers. Still, I mean, we get the same numbers, but for the DPK, you still have some cycles left for other things. But still, I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, one thing that we could sort of think about is if it would make sense to implement vectorized drivers in Linux. I don't know. Uh, if you look at the DPK drivers that are vectorized, they they barely maintainable. You can't read the code, and it's really messy. But the performance is good, so I don't know. And again, for a real application, I'm not sure that it would make sense, actually. Right, so what's next? Uh, try to upstream everything. Uh, so the first th three, th three things, given that the attach and the built-in BPF program is, is a good idea. I'm really open for suggestions uh, there. Uh, it really makes sense from an AFX speed perspective. So uh, again, can be discussed. Uh, the, the second thing is that we really need to put AFXP support into the libbpf because right now AFXP is it's too hard to consume it. So like people, uh, they start looking at it, but it's a bit too complicated. So I think adding like simple helpers into libbpf would really help for people just get going with it. Uh, and then also the supporting multiple uh, transmission sockets for multiple hardware queues. Uh, and again, self-test and samples. I'm almost out of time, but so. 12 minutes. 12, okay. Uh, I think I'll summarize some of these. So, as you see, like, so, for example, for, for egress, we had pretty good, I mean, performance-wise, I think we're, we're close enough for, we had, we're 10% from Deep Decay, which is, I, I think that's acceptable. Uh, as for the receive side, we still need to do more. Uh, so one thing that we're starting to look into is see if we can have, like, explicit huge pages support. Uh, meaning that in the fill ring, instead of passing 
every descriptor you pass, for example, like uh, this page is now, you, you transfer ownership for a whole page to, to the kernel, and then maybe we can get down the coherence traffic between the cores. Skip the second, and also uh, there's a lot of code that are really similar to what the Infiniband guys are doing. Uh, so I think it would make sense to see if we can share, for example, like the UMEM uh, principle stuff like that with uh, uh, with the RDM by people. Okay, so summary. Uh, roughly. Two and a half x performance for both Rx and Tx. Uh, busy polling seems to be a good way, and even though I mean it, it's a good idea, even though with the, the melt-on patches that we pay a lot for each system call. So instead of 50 cycles, we pay roughly 250 cycles. Uh, Deep decay is still faster, but FXP is sort of on par for a real benchmark. Uh, and I say drivers. But I'm, I'm at the Intel, so at Intel drives, we need to think about how, how should we sort of think about going forward when XTP is this new fast path within the, uh, uh, in the kernel. So we're not only like, we need to deal with more things than just SKB. Uh, and again, there's a lot of people that have been really helpful and you know, tried it out and uh, given suggestions, so thanks a lot, guys. It's been uh, really fun. And finally, we have a new logo. Yay. Yeah, so a lot of people ask me about the, the vectorization issue. And uh, to your point, like once you start touching the data, that's the vectorization really doesn't buy you very much. And I, I think if, when you look at the code, it's, I don't know, it's, for, for me it's too messy, but you know, you're, <laughs> I, mean, I guess it, it's a matter of taste. But I'm sure it's theoretically very sexy to think that you can parse eight received descriptors in parallel and do them in two instructions and all that stuff. But uh, in the end, if it doesn't bias any performance for real use cases, uh, you know, it's hard to justify pursuing something like that. However, uh, maybe at some point we can find some way to legitimately let the actual XDP programs do vectorization to a certain extent and see in what scenarios that makes sense and how plausible that is with the way that the FPU uh, in the kernel mechanism works is can we let that happen in all the contexts that XDP could potentially execute in and all those difficult and hard questions that would need to be answered. So uh, that's what I think about the whole vectorization thing. We'll just have to see. You have to notice a lot of XDP and BPF development is, is driven by use not, oh, it seems as if this would help, or it, or it seems as if this would be a direction we should go. We're at the point where people need to use XTP, people need to use BPF, so we know what people need in the future. So, any questions? So, um, for the zero copy, I just, uh, you, you take user space memory, right? you give that to a card. Yep. That basically means I can never free this memory yep. at all. So it's, it's locked into the user space while the application can. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, uh, yeah it's locked, but, but the user can, can mess up the frame. Yeah, for yeah. like for the, you know, just the library API, you want to do like, all right, create this context, start using, now I want to, you know, stop. Free context, I really, um, th there could be ways, you know, to swap in some other pages instead. Without that, it's, it library is kind of problematic, uh, you know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not following. So, so, Sorry? So, I'm not following, really. You could <laughs> say well, so. imagine, like, I'm, I'm thinking, like, you want, we, we'd, we'd want to maybe use this in QMU. Yep. Yeah. And hey, we would, you could stack it up into a guest running into a virtual machine, why not? Yeah. Except uh, we have this device, at some point th the guest might come and say, I reset this virtual device. Or you right. know, remove it. We'd want to maybe give this VM other memory instead. Right, okay. So somehow 
uh, so like you, make, you want like a more... function that I call and I get back my memory or some other memory instead. So I think it's a memory placement issue if the guest has memory reassigned. Uh, right, yeah. We can't hear in the back, sorry. We can't hear in the back. Talk to the microphone. Yeah, talk to the box. I, yeah, I didn't say anything. <laughs> sorry. Like RDMA, if you look at it, you can actually come and say, well, destroy it. It's just right, not yeah, very good in that any accesses will fail. You don't want your NIC to fail. I right. think uh, this is like uh, you need to pin the memory, guest memory, if you are using this model, just like SRIOV. We have to pin the memory, right? That's so, what? what then just use SRIV. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, Mike, so, so you want a, like a more flexible model for the UMAP. Yeah. And that's, uh, again, the valid concern. Okay. Um, is there any hardware offload ever going to come into this? Something we could use is like the hashing and the timestamp from the NIC card. I hope, hopefully, out. at least our like the the one that our customer that really wants this, they said like we can't use this unless we have uh, some way of like expressing metadata. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the the next big thing. So without that, I'd say this is not really useful. I, I so guess that also comes down to we have. To not every adapter supports that, so we're going to have to get to the point that XDP, metadata, right, variable metadata and that type yeah. of thing, which doesn't seem to be well supported in there. Uh, any thought of, uh, let's say, if it's um, a PF packet or something like that, there's, well, it's not really reference counting, but I could have more than one listener in there. Is there ever going to be some kind of support for that? Uh, like I noticed that I can't return, um, oh, like uh, XDP, uh, uh, it's always XDP drop. It's never. Um, I, you, uh, mean, you mean like a clone functionality? Yeah. 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 Again, and I think William uh, said neither from VMware. Okay. <laughs> William. Thank you. Yeah. That's, n that's not, <laughs> so the, yeah, first, <laughs> that's yeah, not, that's not yeah. the first time we've heard yeah. about a need for a clone. So you guys want clone, yeah. right? And so people well, wanting. Want uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, Yes, I pass it we, to the we clone like that as well. We'd also like to be able to clone slash copy package to user space. That's it. Really. Anyone else? Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.